Having successfully launched three businesses, bilingual mum to two and entrepreneur Antonia Bozan Brown has connected with thousands of people, both French and international, since moving to the French Riviera. These connections allow her to speak with successful local businesses and inspirational people about life here on the Côte d'Azur and share it with you. Welcome to the Riviera Firefly podcast with your host, entrepreneur and my mum, Antonia Bozan Brown. Welcome to the Riviera Firefly podcast to Robert Levitt. Have I pronounced your surname correctly? Well, it, it, it gets pronounced so many different ways here in France. Um, uh, I would say Levitt, but here in France they say Levitt. So uh, <laughs> both of them work fine. I can't wait to get to know you. We literally do not know each other. This is this century, isn't it, where we're sort of meeting over the internet for the very first time. Well, it's great. So I had a look at your website. So I had an in-depth look at a video that you did when you were sort of doing all your investment and international banking and you were being interviewed about that. You have got an incredibly interesting history. Take me right back to where you were born and where you were brought up. Well, I was born in, in uh, the U.S. I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, so pretty sleepy place. One of the, um, you know, one of the quieter states in, in, uh, in the U.S. Close, uh, basically, we lived 2,500 meters in the, in, the, in, the, in the Rocky Mountains. And at one point, I got involved in politics because it was quite difficult to, to leave a place like that. And uh, it was a long shot candidate who ended up winning and took me with him to Washington, D.C. And uh, from there, I, I completed my uh, MBA and I got involved in creating an investment firm for myself. And I moved to Florida uh, where I had uh, some children that grew up in Florida. And then I started to move global and I started to, to have an investment firm that was working throughout the world. And at some point, I started uh, refugee schools in Malaysia. I also spent a lot of time in Indonesia, where I was doing ethnographic work. But the basic of our investment firm was that we did on-the-ground investing. So it wasn't looking at screens and, and counting free cash flow, but basically going on the ground into, I was into probably more than 100 countries, to see how they were being affected by globalization. And, um, of course, that's a big issue today with the Gilet Joan in France because you have winners and you have losers. And France was clearly, in my mind, one of the losers. But so many countries were winners. Indonesia was clearly a winner. Lots of Asian countries were winners. Lots of countries in Africa were winners. And uh, my job was to go in and to really try to understand from the grassroots level how these things were occurring. And then I had clients who were giving me uh, a lot of money to, to invest anywhere in the world. And so this is what I, I did up until around uh, 2014. And then uh, I moved to France in 2008. And uh, when I stopped working on the investment business, I started working on getting to know this area, just like I got to know areas that I had invested in. And so one of the things that I really needed to do was to learn the local language. So I tried to learn Provençal, Lou Provençal, which is uh, what they speak in, in the area I am when I'm near Grasse, Le Barcelou. And uh, I went to a group of, of people in Grasse that were mostly older people that already had uh, spoken it pretty well. And uh, I tried to, to pay attention and, and to learn. And then I learned there was a program at the University of Nice at the time. It was a, a patrimony program for a licence undergraduate degree, which I took, and I, I got a license in patrimony, so I studied the local history, the local languages, the local literature, and the local church, just about everything that goes with the history and the patrimony of the Côte d'Azur. That was pretty interesting to me, and it led me to then going on to, to become a medieval historian, getting Master's one, Master's two at the University of Lyon. Uh, where I wrote my uh, memoir on uh, my thesis on uh, an individual from, from this area, from uh, Basilou, which was part of the family de Grasse. His name was Moriel de Albarno. He wasn't really well known here, but it turns out he's extremely well known in, in, in Italy. And there are towns with, his, with festivals after him. There are streets named after him. There's even a wine named after him. But he was, uh, really wasn't known in this area. And there were lots of reasons for it. And it was a great, fun historical project. I learned a great deal. And now I hope to turn it into, into a book. But being that I started to get into uh, the academic world, 
and that I had gotten into uh, the local level the way I like to, really profoundly, not from the point of view of living someplace and being an expatriate, but, but how do you break into the local community? And uh, actually, I moved initially to, to Cannes. I lived there two years. I was learning French. I didn't really speak any French before. I started learning French. I started trying it, and people would respond to me in English. And, you know, it was really disappointing to, you know, to practice your French and get a response in English. And so I would have to go back to them and, oh, I can speak a little English if we speak slowly. And then they assumed I didn't speak English, and then they were forced to, to speak French to me. But once I moved out a little bit uh, towards uh, to Le Basilou, uh, lots of people didn't speak English here. In fact, most people don't speak English. In fact, in the region, a large percentage of the people don't speak English. And to have a mastery of French was, uh, was, really, uh, really, was really eventually very important. But to have the ability to speak a few, a few things in Provençal opened the world to people opened the world to me, one a world that I probably would not have been able to get into had I not been able to sort of break that ice because no one had ever met uh, an American, a foreigner who, who was interested in learning Provençal. It's just, <laughs> just very, very rare. You've actually blown me away with your intro. Chapeau, as they say. That's incredible to be able to learn French to that level, to be able to follow uh, all those courses and what you have done. That's incredible. And I didn't know you were a fellow Barrois. I'm from there too. And one of the right? things, yeah, one of the things that fascinates me right near my house, there's a monument, you'll have seen it on the Route de Grasse as you drive into Barcelou, and it's a monument for two fallen soldiers uh, that the Nazis brought them there to sort of show the Barrois, teach them a lesson that uh, they shouldn't sort of uprise against the Nazis. And every year, there's a little procession and people come all dressed in their finest splendor with medals and their wreaths to pay honor an homage to these two people that were fighting in the Second World War. And it's, I've it's never, lovely. I've never attended that, but it sounds very, very, uh, something that would interest me a great deal. Yeah, I'll send, I'll, what I'll do is I'll take a photo of the monument and send you their names. If you live in this area, then you know that it's not very easy to sort of impl implement yourself into the, the local culture here. There's a, this is the home or the, the birthplace of someone named Admiral de Grasse, who was instrumental in, in the U, U.S defeating the English in the Revolutionary War in America. Of course, it was also the French involvement, Louis XVI's involvement in the US, which caused the downfall of Louis XVI a few years later because he had put the country in so much debt. But in this area, there is an association called the Franco-American Association. And interestingly enough, there were zero Americans. So it took me uh, about five years before they finally invited me to to join into the into the organization, and then when they when they introduced me to the crowd or the audience, they said he speaks better Provençal than he speaks French, which is not <laughs> true. It was quite a commentary. Are there many people left from World War Two living in Barcelou, or are we sort of at the uh, the the last? people there now? Well, I think there were, um, in fact, there was a large immigration into Barcelou from, from uh, southern Italy and northern Italy too, from Piedmont region and from Calabria after the Second World War. So I think that's the, a great percentage of the, uh, the population came because of and after the war. But also a number of people came to help build the roads here. They built the roads up to Gordon, et cetera, and they were living in, uh, in the Barcelou. Do you have a, a typical period in history that fascinates you the most? Actually, no. I, I've been working on the medieval period, and since I worked on um, the, the family de Grasse, we had to begin, I began in sort of the year 972, which was when uh, this area uh, recovered from the Dark Ages. But uh, now I, I prepare uh, historical reports, and I get to look at everything from the feudality from the 15th and 16th century uh, Moulin in uh, the local area, L L L or something of this sort, to um, houses that came about from Menton, uh, villas that were built there for the village at Tour, for the, for the tourism. Because, you know, this area, Nice, was, was, is the birthplace of tourism. And then I get to look at houses like the one we're doing now in uh, Supercan, which was um, a, a sort of like what we call a carpet bagger, somebody who between the wars started to build low cost housing in Paris and made a fortune, of course, ended up going to prison because he was paying off people to get these jobs. But he built a, a, a villa in, uh, in Golf Chouan, uh, Valeris, 
And uh, so the history, all of the history to me is, is simply fascinating. We live in a very, very interesting place. It's easy to skip it and to miss it if you, if you are unaware, but it is really, once you get to understand it, once you sort of figure out how to enter into it, it it's, it, it's internally fascinating. And is it, um, when you look at American history, it doesn't go back as far as European history. So does that make it more interesting for you? Is that why you've sort of found your way over here, do you think? Well, there's you know, lots of reasons why I don't want to live or return to America, mostly because it's such a consumer society. But in choosing to be a medievalist, I have to master Latin. So it was just one more thing that makes it more interesting because once you're able to go back into the Latin, you're able to put on a different mindset. It's like any language. When you learn another language, you're able to think differently. And so by going back to Latin, you, you, you really completely think in a different way. And for me, it's, it's the only way I can sort of put myself back into the, into the shoes of somebody at the time. For example, I'll give you a, a, a case. We have something in, um, in this area in in La Buig, which is um, which is the, uh, a sanctuary from the 14th century, and they call it the Sistine Chapel of the Alps. And essentially, it was it was um, a sanctuary painted by someone named uh, Carnavasio. Carnavasio was an interesting middle middle uh, uh, middle age artist. And he painted some really amazing scenes with great symbolism where you can see all the anti-Semitic symbols and things like this that, that take some, uh, some real knowledge to be able to, to understand. But this isn't what interests me. What interests me as my background and having read a lot of the Latin of the people of the time is that when I enter that sanctuary, I'm seeing on that wall images of of Christ, and I had never before, as a someone from the 14th or 15th century, seen an image. Like I had heard about him, I had been told about him, I had heard the stories, but I had never seen him. I had never seen how Judas might be, or an image of the flagellation, or any of these things. And so it's it's like okay, an art historian can talk about the 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 artist and they can talk about you know the, the techniques and this one compares to this one and something else but when you can put yourself back in the, the shoes of the person entering that sanctuary for the first time and realizing that they have never it's like reading reading a book and then seeing the movie you know the image of the movie is very different than the image you had of the book and so for these people to to be given that image puts you in a completely different state of mind when you're seeing some of these uh, historical um, uh, scenes, monuments, uh, whatever, whatever we want to call them. And that's what makes the history interesting, to be able to put yourself back into the shoes of those people, to be able to paint the colors, to be able to, to see, the, um, well, see the colors, smell the smells, and feel what it was like to be there, not necessarily understanding, as they wouldn't have, anything about the artist, and maybe not, nothing about the symbols either. But what was it like to walk in and get that sensation from this half-lit building with, you know, all kinds of fantastic artwork. What's one of your most favorite reports that you've written? It must, you must get those magic moments where you unlock something and you're like, wow. Well, <laughs> it's a very interesting uh, thing to say, magic moments, but it happens all the time because every, every time we do a historical report, we unlock something. And so when, um, when, you, when you look at uh, uh, certain areas of, um, of the region, you have to then understand what it was about. So, for example, if you are in Menton, you have to realize that Menton was, you know, it's the, they have the lemon festival. Why do they have a lemon festival? Because lemons, they were, they grew very well in Menton and lemons were then used to, uh, to fight scurvy. So the sailors had to have the lemons, which means that in a period of something like 20 years, when you look at photos from a 20 year period in the 19th century, one to the other, you see that Menton just, you know, just took off. And then you realize there were certain people and who they were in those areas. And I mean, it just the pieces start to fit together. And so the, um, the fun of, of history is, you know, when you put pieces together that were not put together, that's what makes it so interesting. When I did my focus on Moriel del Barno, no one had really ever even heard of him, even in the village. They didn't even know that the village had been called Albarno. And that's the, you know, 
that's when you start opening up your world because as soon as you realize there's a name, a Latin name that you didn't know, and you start looking for those kinds of things, and you realize there were almost 70 letters from the Pope to, 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 to this Morial and his, uh, and his uncle and the king and all of these things. I mean, this is just, you know, a local guy that no one had ever paid attention to. And yet there's an enormous history. And when you, you know, when I walk through the village, you know, I see all kinds of things that I point out that you probably have never been, you know, cognizant of until you become aware of. And just like your monument from the Second World War, it just then takes on, you know, it takes on, it takes on a new life. And, and that's the second part that you do, don't you? But on your site, uh, vianisa.com, you do do visits for adults, for kids. And I guess, is that because you've got to learn so much about Montan and Barcelou that you can now really give us this interactive tour? Well, that, that helps, but that's not the reason why I started Via Nizza. Via Nizza was started because I thought that the tourism that I found in Europe was really boring. I, I was just bored by it. And I don't want to go to a town and hire a, a, a guide whose background is in tourism, you know, and, and, um, and then, you know, they start telling you the stories of, of Louis, you know, and, and Louis the ninth and Louis the 14th and Louis the 16th and, and, you know, and, and St. Louis and, you know, and before it's all over your head, you, you don't follow any of it. Just like, you know, in, if you go to Prague, you hear about Charles this and Charles that and Charles the great, and, but they never tell you Charlemagne. They never tell you the name that we actually learn as, 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 as people in school and in English speaking schools. So the education was always different. But the second thing is I wanted to understand what the real was. I didn't want to go to, to visit a village that was a tourist village or, you know, even old town. I mean, it's, it's in, it exists to sell to tourism. I, I wasn't interested in, in tourism. I wanted to know what the real was going on. I wanted to know what was uh, occurring not just in the past, but in the present. For example, if I was going to be uh, looking at the Jilly Joan, today's example, I would want to take people to meet the Jilly Joan, to get their explanation of why they're there, what they're doing, what their emphasis is. And it's amazing when you take a foreigner to meet a local person, they will open up in a way that they will not open up to a, to a um, uh, to, to a French person because they, there's, a, there's a feeling of, of what do they want. So we started, for example, we started taking people to, the, to meet the immigrants. You know, we hear all about this clandestines, these immigrants that come from Africa. We hear about the slave market. We see all that in television, but let's go find out. Let's go find out what it really is like. So we would take people to, to, Mento, uh, to, to Ventimiglia, and we would go under that bridge that, you know, looks pretty scary with uh, people that look scary, and uh, we would we would just talk to them. And it turns out that they were very, very friendly and very, very anxious to tell their story. And then we would actually take people on the hike, the walk across the border from the Italian side to the French side, which is the same walk that has been taken for hundreds and hundreds of years as people cross into France. And then we look at, you know, areas like the religion. Um, you have a lot of issues in this, uh, in, you know, in France with, with Islam and Muslims. Well, instead of, you know, hearing my opinion, which nobody really wants to hear, or, you know, or, or somebody else's opinion, let's go meet them. And so we started arranging dinner at their house, they would cook, you know, they would make a couscous dinner, and then we'd have a conversation and you'd get to hear it from their perspective. And this was what I wanted when I wanted to travel. It wasn't about sitting in a cafe with, you know, with with my friend, it was sitting with someone I don't know. It was looking around, you know, at the restaurant while I was there with the people that I came with and looking at all the interesting people that I would rather be sitting with, not because I don't like the people I'm with, but because they look like they're really interesting. And so the aspect of what we try to do in the tourism side, the Via Nizza side, the visit side, is to what I call integration. And, and if you know that tourism began in in Nice, it was the birthplace of tourism. It was all about separation. They separate the tourists from the locals. It was, you know, somebody with a flag walking around, that guide, that guide speaks your language, so they already have removed themselves much from their world to try to understand you. And they remember that the last client they had didn't like broccoli, and so they, didn't, they don't serve you broccoli. And, and so all of the, the, the real is gone. They are trying to give you what they think you want because they studied tourism in school or because they had previous people. But I don't want any of that. If I go someplace, I want to meet the real people. And if 
we find that the real people, the people who, and I don't just mean going into a local bar, and that is fine. It's a good thing to do, believe me, going into a local bar. But if you, if you want to meet people who are a little bit higher um, um, specialty, somebody who really is very knowledgeable about something, you can't find them so easily. And also what you tend to find here is a separation between tourism and cultural mediation. So those who are in cultural mediation are people who tend to do what they do as a noble cause. For example, there are no private historians in, in France, as far as I know. The private historians, everybody works for the government. And if you work for the government, you're not able to work outside and do things separately, which is why I found that what we do with writing reports is, you know, is there's a huge demand because no one's ever done this before. But if you look at the, uh, the idea of integrating, integrating, then what that means is you really want to understand what you're seeing. I mean, people say, oh, I'm going to go to Paris. You know, they'll see the Tour Eiffel, the Louvre, the Notre Dame. Oh, I've been to Paris. You know, I can check the boxes. But they never met a French person. And you can see the same thing all over the world. People want access, but they can't get it. And the people that are from the tourism industry can't provide it either because, well, it's it's too intimidating. They're afraid to go themselves. And I can tell you, when I took these people in Italy under the bridge, they, they were nervous. Okay? They were, they were, it was not something that it was completely outside of their comfort zone. But I had done it. I knew it was safe. I knew it was fine. And when they come in, it's like an experience. It's the kind of thing they're going to go home and talk about. It's the kind of thing that they're never going to forget. This is what Viennesis is about. We want to give people these experiences that are real. Not what did the tour guide say about the Gilles Joan, but what did the Jilly Jones say? What's it like? What are they doing? Who are these people? What is their real issues? And that's not something most foreigners can do by themselves. It's not something that they have the comfort level to do. They don't have the language skills to do. It, uh, there's a, a sort of like a communication difficulty because when you first go, they look at you like, who are you? You know, what do you want? There's, there's all these kinds of things. And so you have to learn to break it down. I spent 20 years or 25 years of my career going to do what I called man on the street interviews, you know, asking people about their lives. And what I found, and I did that in some of the worst slums, you know, of Pakistan. And, you know, sometimes it even got me in trouble actually. But what I found is people love to tell their story. They're anxious to tell their story, especially to someone who's not from the area who's interested. Wow. That is a very, very niche way of looking at tourism. And I, I love it. I mean, I love to go and do a tour whenever we go away traveling with, with a local person showing us. So I'm going to have to look for more tours like this that really get you in under the skin of it. I don't think it, it's ever been done before. I, I really don't believe it exists. I've never found it before. So that's why we created it. Um, it's not because, you know, we make a lot of money doing things, uh, taking people on these kinds of visits. But it's because you have you have sophisticated people who are not just interested anymore in you know in just seeing the the, the sites and of course this started with this guy named Baedeker I think I'm uh, probably mispronouncing it who wrote the first guidebook in the 19th century and he said you know you should go see the eternal sites before that people would go see how people really lived they would go to you know schools and hospitals and try to compare their life to someone else and this is what we want it's the life of some it's to understand a life we don't know so when i had schools in in malaysia afghan refugees they were afghan refugees that were living in malaysia i would take visitors um, to the school i would not just walk them through open the door you know i would call the teacher out i would put the visitor in and then i would say hey can you uh, i'll see you in a few minutes you know i'd close the door and an hour later well here they are you know there is someone from you know let's say uh, uh, boca raton florida they're looking in front of all these these kids, boys and girls that that are wearing Afghan clothing. They've never experienced this in their lives. They've never really had any communication with people from this culture, this religion, this world. And they are forced to interact. And after an hour, I mean, you, you know, the photos start and, and it's, it's yeah. you know, it's, these are the kinds of experiences that, that make traveling, in my opinion. This is what makes it so Because we're living in a world right now where we're putting up barriers, we're Brexiting, we've got Mr. Trump doing his thing, and it's sort of a, a global thing right now where we're sort of putting these barriers back up, and it's the perfect way to break those barriers back down and understand one another. I love well, the, the, you know, the, a good part of the reason we are seeing these issues, you know, maybe the Brexit or Trump or the Jilly Joan is because these are the people that were the losers.
losers from globalization. And what I would think was that France was a loser, but it's not true. Many people in France were winners of globalization. It's a large sector and turns out to be the majority of the population, more than 50%, they ended up being the loser. But you know, this is, this is, not, um, this is a story I think people wanna know. Like if you go to the United States, you can go to Times Square, you can see New York City, but when I take people there, I take them to a, you know, to a, a football game, you know, where you see real Americans, you know, and you want to see, tr meet Trump voters. Why are they, why do they love this guy? What is it? You know, because the rest of us are knocking our head against the wall, like trying to figure out what kind of, why would they like him? But when you ask them, you, you get, a, you get an insight now of what America's like, not from the newspapers, not from the, you know, from the big city that everybody wants to go to, which is filled, by the way, with foreigners, all the shops. You know, just like if you go to London, the guy behind the, the counter at the store is going to be from Pakistan or someplace else. You know, for me, it's to go up to Birmingham and Manchester and to, you know, then I'm, in, then I'm in England. You know, before that, I'm in London. And it's not the same thing. And it's so much more interesting. It's so true. About a year ago, I think Trump was in by then. I was on a, I took a train from San Francisco down to LA, which not many people do, right? Because normally you fly. But I wanted to get on this train that had a glass roof and you got this amazing visuals of the, of the countryside for, I think it was about nine hours. And so of course you're eating and drinking and, and what have you. And it was brilliant because I was sitting with all these people I'd never met before as traveling alone. And, and they were just suddenly all talking about Trump and it was fascinating. Some people were working in local politics, another one was a lecturer. And it was just interesting to see all the different backgrounds and to see how they weren't fitting um, a stereotype, but they were still all for Trump and to hear their, their ideas and why they were backing him. It was a great experience. That's exactly <laughs> what I mean by integration. You're, mm. you know, you're putting yourself, you were probably the only foreigner in the train maybe or in the discussion, but your views were interesting to them as well. By the way, they're all interested in hearing your views from, from the outside, but by putting yourself in the, in the mix, it's the experience you don't forget, and you're still talking about it, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, it was great. In fact, I'll put a link in the show notes to that train ride. It was great fun. So I, I find it fascinating that you can go from investment banking uh, to working in schools and then to be doing this. What, what was it? Was there something lacking in investment banking? Was there well, a look, it wasn't thing? investment banking. I was. I ran an investment fund, which I, I had created myself. Um, I had really, basically, should never have done it because, I. I'm not supposed to be able to do things like this, but I wasn't very bright. You know, I didn't do well in university. I went to the local university in New Mexico. I flunked out. I took a year off. I f barely finished, you know, and, and so I had, I was the last person that should be doing this kind of thing. And because I was so dumb, I didn't realize that I couldn't do it. And so I just did it because it was what I wanted to do. And then one day I found myself listed as one of the top 200 advisors in the country. And in 1998, my career just took off. And, and then I was, you know, I was interviewed by, by everybody. So anytime I would be in any major city, it would be CNBC or Bloomberg. I, could, I was automatically invited and I was on front pages of newspapers. And it was, you know, it was, a, it was very exciting for a while. But at some point, you know, when the, um, it, it, it reminds me of a, of, a, of a book damage, but you know, at some point when the, the grass is, is grows without being watered and everything is perfect, it's, it's time to, to mess it up, you know, because life is becomes like 10 years go by and, and you didn't live it. And so to come into an environment like, for example, France or Indonesia or Malaysia or, or any of the other places I was, um, you know, it's a real experience. And, and at one time I had a goal of, you know, being able to do something where, or go someplace where my passport didn't matter, where my, the color of my skin didn't matter, where money didn't matter. And, and it was kind of in the back of my head until one day I found myself in Bangui, Central Africa in prison. That was uh, my 50th birthday, you know. So other people, they, were, they have a small party. Me, I, I was, you know, I had a memorable experience, you know. And I spent two weeks in this prison not knowing if I would live to get to the other side. But this is, you know, this is what I, what I was looking for. I was looking to get deeper, not shallow, and, and have an experience that always were right. I, I would be I would be memorable and always doing something stupid that if I was smarter I wouldn't have done but because I'm not so smart I ended up creating things that you're not supposed to create 
before, but you've studied in French university. I'm not having that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, French university, that's uh, quite, quite stressful, you know, quite stressful. <laughs> I grind my teeth down to nothing uh, in, terms of, 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 uh, in the French university. Yeah, and it's a very different way to the Anglophone and the USA University. I studied for about six or eight weeks in Bordeaux University, and it was totally different from my experience back in, back in Britain. Um, tell me a little bit about some of your funny experiences, because I guess coming from, even from England here, but more so from America here, uh, customer service is very different. It sort of takes an adjustment period, doesn't it? And, and then suddenly you get, you get through the adjustment and you embrace it. Uh, it for, for me, it's like Sunday shopping. When I first came here, I could not believe shops were shut on a Sunday. I was like, oh my right, God, are they not there? And yet yeah. now, especially as I've got two teenagers, one is a girl, I'm thrilled that it's shut on a Sunday because that's the day she'd like to hop down to Polygon. And I'm like, well, we can't, it's shut. And it's great because you do more family things and we're getting out and we're enjoying the Cote d'Azur. So what, what's it been for you? What's that experience been for you? Now? You know, there's all, everybody I'm sure that has lived in this area has, has their stories. You know, mine, maybe one of my stories was I had been told that if you live in the area and you, you can exchange your driver's license within a, a certain period of time, something like nine months, you can exchange a driver's license for a French driver's license. But if you are American, there are only 10 states that qualify. And so for me at the time, since I really thought I would have no chance of passing the French uh, uh, code or the route, um, I decided to, to, to go and exchange my license. And I went to the Sioux Prefecture in Grass, and I said, I'm here to exchange my license. It's from Florida. And she said, well, Florida is not on the list, she told me. And I said, well, of course it's on the list. And she goes, well, what list? Where did you find it? I said, from the internet. And I actually pulled it out and I showed her the list of 10 states of which Florida was on. And she told me, well, the internet makes mistakes all the time. If you don't like it, write a letter, suivant, you know? And I was like shocked, okay? Because I couldn't write a letter. I didn't have that capability of writing a letter and I didn't know what I was gonna do. So after a while, I thought about it, and I decided, ah, I know what to do. I will go back in August, because everybody in France is on holiday in August, and she won't be there. <laughs> so I waited two more months. I went back to Grasse, and wouldn't you know, it was the same lady. And so I braved up, prayed she didn't remember me, and I said, I'm here to exchange my license. And she said, okay, no problem. Took it, gave me the, you know, and was set. So, you know, it. It's just you have to understand a little bit about the process. And it's, it takes you, well, it's beaten into you. I don't think you can intellectualize it, but you eventually do learn it. You learn sort of the way they think and the, you know, the checking the boxes are far more important. Whereas, you know, in America, it was the results. You know, if you could show them a way to get to the result, they got it. Here, customer is one word service is another customer doesn't go together with service you know and so it's you know you come into to the shop and you're waiting while they kiss everybody in the shop you know because they're the people are more important and you know it's and it's okay it's it's um something you get used to you begin to like you begin to it takes a while to to like it i must admit but eventually you're you're the one being kissed you know and and so it's um it, it it's really it's a fantastic place to live, but it's, it takes some time. And because it's difficult, and, and you know, in, in here, in my opinion, the French, they tend to put everything in a box. And there are no boxes that sort of combine. And so when I wanted to start a business, and I was going to do a tourism business, they said, well, you know, I said, you have to have a, be a licensed tourist guide, tour guide. Okay, so what do you need to be a licensed tour guide? Well, to be a licensed tour guide, you have to go back to undergraduate school for a year, learn English, hello, you know, I think I can do this, and history, hello, I'm in a doctorate program as a historian, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just not going to go back with 18-year-olds in, you know, and do an undergraduate degree. So this idea, they have these rules that, that you know, to be a tour guide, you have to be like this. And then there are other rules to be in the transportation business. You have to be here. You're either a transport person, you're a tour person. Then to do historical reports, you, you don't fit into the box. So it's, you know, it's, it's what it means is that 
the whole world here is completely open for you. Because if you can put two boxes together, we were thinking at the time doing a coffee shop together with a traveler's cafe. You know, you can't do that because there are two boxes, but we can. And so you just have to do it and you just have to realize that the opportunities are enormous. Because here we are doing historical reports. We have um, uh, a lot of English speaking clients that want them. We have Russian speaking clients that want them. We have French speaking clients that want them and they've never been done before. So that's because they don't fit into any box. There's no sort of road. When I, you know, when I study history, I did my, um, my master's, now my doctorate, they tell you, you know, the only way you can be uh, in history is to teach. You know, you can teach in the college or teach in the lycée, but here I am doing something that is really fun and it doesn't involve the lycée or the college. And so this is the way, you know, you just have to not let their, the thinking be a negative, but turn into a positive to try to figure out some way to combine boxes, stay out of the box, because then you enter into the French competitive world. If you can combine boxes and you can create something that's, yeah. uh, that's really fascinating. And if you can put customer service together, wow, because that's something that people are not really uh, used to getting. Uh, so often in the uh, Cote d'Azur. I, I love that, that thought. I've read the book, um, you know, like it is the red ocean and the, the blue ocean and trying to create your business so that you're in the blue ocean, which is nice and empty and you've not got a lot of competition, which is what you're saying is putting the two boxes together and breaking the silo mentality as opposed to the red ocean, which is full of fish and you know, they're all scrabbling after little bits of food. So I did that with my business. We teach English, but through fun activities. So here you have people that teach English in that pure method, or you have Centre Loisir where children are going and doing fun activities. And we brought the two together. And of course, when we went to the French administration and said, this is what we want to do, they were like, well, are you A or are you B? And we're like, well, we're not either. We're A, B. Right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. And so there you create your own niche, just as you have with your historical reports and your visits. You create a, a niche, and hopefully there's a need for it, and then, uh, and then you get a successful business. Well, but it's the same thing with, with children, by the way, because um, I have a stepdaughter, and she came here when she was 12, and she came from Lithuania. So she spoke, her native language was uh, Polish. She was uh, from uh, the Polish minority of Lithuania, went to Polish schools, and now she comes to France. Now, she doesn't really speak much English. She doesn't speak any French. She, she knows Russian, although she can't read it. She knows it just because of people in the neighborhood. And so I put her into a, a bilingual school. And so it was uh, French, English, and so she learned English. She ended up uh, with a, a boyfriend who was French but spoke to her in English, and her English got pretty good. And eventually I realized, you know, here she was without any French. And so, well, everybody told me I was crazy and they, they were, uh, everybody was opposed, especially the school, but I pulled her out of that school and I put her in college, French college, just normal French college. Okay. With French. And she was forced to learn it. And that year was the year she had to take her brevet. And everyone told me, it's okay. You know, she'll learn. She doesn't have to pass the brevet. They'll let her go on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there's no way this girl can master in one year all the things that you need to master. And, you know, I knew that this was, this was the connery because I had been – teaching kids in Malaysia English that had come from a background in Farsi. They didn't know a word in English, and I didn't speak a word of Farsi, neither did any of the other teachers. But we knew they could learn. And so, um, so my daughter, when she took her brevet, she not only passed it, but got mentioned Trabian, you know? So it's like, hello, this is, don't, don't let anyone here tell you what you can't do. And that's the, the thing that they always try to do. Well, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Well, yes, you can. You just, the dumber you are, you don't realize that you're not supposed to not be able to do it. And you find that you can't. And so, you know, now she's in a, uh, in a CIV where she's doing Russian and French and English. And, you know, she has the best of everything. So this, you know, you, you can turn these negatives all into positives by just, uh, okay, it's true. There were some nights that she was not happy with me and she was pretty upset about the difficulty in making friends, you know, 
but she has now mastered French and she can now get a job in, in France, you know, and she can do these things. If she wants to go to university here, she will be able to. And so by breaking the, um, the rules, by looking at things from a different perspective, by not letting people tell you what you know better, um, you can find that this area can be wonderful. Well, it can be wonderful and it's hugely open for opportunity. Yeah, I totally agree. The, the power of positivity is huge and it's ingrained in my business is positive approach to learning. Because I think if you tell a child that they can't or an adult that they can't do something, that's where they're going to work to. Whereas if you're doing, and that's why I love the American viewpoint is how positive it is and how hooray it is over there. I love it when I go over there and get a bit of that and bring it back here. And I do, I do hope that we can bring some of that into the education system over here. Because uh, I think it just would, would help learning and make it more pleasurable for everyone. Uh, and, you know, we, we talked a little bit off air just before we started recording about positivity and um, my group, Cot Does Your Living, and how things can turn negative. And one of the reasons I started uh, the Riviera Firefly podcast was because of the Attentat in Nice on the 14th of July a couple of years ago, where right. tourism bombed. And all I could see in Cote d'Azur Living was people saying, what am I going to do? I rely on tourism and no one's coming. The Americans have cancelled all their things. The Russians aren't coming, whatever. And so I'd kind of wanted to start a podcast. And I thought, well, you know, I was kind of looking for the idea. And I was like, well, why don't we do it where we can sort of put a little spotlight on the French Riviera uh, and bring some positivity back. And so we'll get to those questions later. I'd love to know your places to go where you recommend we should go, that kind of thing. Um, but positivity is so important and what you're saying about arriving in this country and it being different from what we were used to, you do go into a bit of a downward spiral sometimes and I think we do have to work ourselves back up and embrace the current culture. So what, give us some tips on how you've managed, I know obviously following the education, learning the language, they were huge that's helped with your integration. What other things would you say? Well, yes, but not everybody does that. Number one, um, I think the way that they are taught French, especially adults, I think can be very, very challenging because you have teachers that teach you grammar and grammar is, you know, for me, if you do more than three months of grammar, you've done too much. Now I've learned a number of different languages, particularly Asian languages, but what I want to do is I need to listen and I need, you know, this is the, the to me, it's the secret. You know, you listen to something, not once you listen to it, you know, 50 times, a hundred times. I used to listen to the invite of Bourdon direct, which was, you know, a, a politicians and politics of France. And I would listen to one 20 minute podcast uh, 50 times if I needed to, till I knew every single word. And the mistake I think people make in language is they don't listen to the same thing. So they don't get the repetition to where they really, um, they really learn the words. But in, you know, overall philosophy of, of life is in me, in my case, I believe that you're writing a novel of your life. And so you want to write something that people are going to be interested in wanting to read. And anybody who's come to the Cote d'Azur is, you know, and left their homeland is already taking a huge, a huge difficult step to do something in a, in a foreign environment. And living outside of your language can, can always be, is, is always challenging. Even those who prefer to, you know, to remain in, um, you know, an expatriate life. But the one challenge that, that I think people really need to focus on is just to wake up and read the next day of their life and not look down the road at the end of the, how the chapter ends or how the book ends and, and, you know, and, and see only the negative and fear. If you, if you, you know, and this is what I was, was drilled into me to get through university. You just do one day at a time. And, and, and like this in a, in a difficult environment where every day you'll just learn a few new words in another language. I mean, the learning for people who love to learn like myself and you, obviously it's, it's just like a, like a fantastic environment in, in which to learn. And so those in the first year or two, it's hard, you know, and you want to quit and you want to give up. I didn't have the option to be able to, to, to give up. It was like the, the boats were burned, you know, and I was forced to, to stay on, on the Island. But for those who can, who, you know, who feel frustrated, just give it time. It just takes time before you change the way you think and what's interesting to you in the past is, is maybe not going to be as interesting to you 
in the future as you begin to realize that this world here in France, Côte d'Azur, you know, Provence um, is, is really, has got their own rhythm and they have their own interests. And, and the more you're able to, to, to realize that and to get into their world and to really you begin to appreciate it, enjoy it, and it, and it really does take time because there's so many nuances, so many differences. It, it seems like they're very similar, but, but in reality, they're very, very different. Very wise words. How would you apply that now to business? Because obviously you've set up businesses in different places. France, has that been very different? Has it been easier? Have you found it more challenging? No, France is, 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 is one of the hardest. You know, I remember being in the Côte d'Azur, and uh, not the Côte d'Azur, the Côte d'Ivoire in Africa. And somebody was telling me how difficult business is to create there. And I'm like, are you kidding? That's nothing. You know, come to France. It, it's, it's very complicated. But, but once you've been through it, you know, I had to take a test uh, for, um, for to be able to drive people. Um, so you, you have to take a test. So you, you had to learn to code to the root. But I had to learn all the business functions and, and all of it in French. You know, all the different kinds of associations and organizations and the SARL and the SAS and the, you know, e and, and, and the micro entrepreneur and all the laws that change. And I can tell you, most people don't realize the laws that exist because I hear still people telling me things that just, they've changed in the last two years. And so many changes have occurred that people have not caught up with. But this is, this is important. If you're going to do a business, you need to understand the various forms of business here and the options. Don't let your um, lawyer tell you what to do because it's, it's fine to have your lawyer eventually tell you what to do and to follow their advice. But it's really important that you understand it yourself. Uh, that's, you know, and it's not that complicated. It, you know, in a few days, you can learn about all the various different business forms and how to set up a company, et cetera, et cetera. But, but take the time to, to figure it out and to learn. I'm sure there are people, you may know people, Antonia, that, uh, that offer those kinds of services that can walk you through how to set up the right kind of company. And, and try to do it right the first time because if you have to do it a second time it's really like starting from the beginning so dream big and think about what it will be not you know not today but what you envision it to be and start in that way from from the you know from the beginning oh that's a, yeah really really important advice it suddenly made me remember that the legal advice and the accounting advice that i feel you get in this country is very different to what you might get in Britain, say, and I'm guessing in the States as well, where they might, you have to be so specific in your questions here. And if you don't ask the right questions, they won't necessarily volunteer the advice to you. Um, so I think that you're right, going on these courses where you sort of learn everything and then you can go and fine tune it by getting legal advice on, on SARLs. And yeah, I, I think even closing a business down is even more complicated than opening a business sometimes. Like I've heard that closing an SARL is a lot more complicated than setting one up. So um, yeah, it's not to be taken lightly. And doing uh, due diligence and the coursework in advance. Did you do it in French or in English? I did it in, in French because I, I was doing it as part of the exam that I had to take for, uh, for driving. I had to take a, an exam to be able to drive others, you know, tourists. So uh, half the course really was on, you know, on, on gestion management commerce in France, how to set up a company, what to do, what you're allowed to do, taxes, TV, TVA, T, uh, you know, the value added tax, et cetera, et cetera. All of this. I think the, really the commerce, the CCI, they do have a, a wing now in English and they are doing courses now in English. They are so much more dynamic than, that, than they were when I set my business up 12 years ago. So I think that, and they're very approachable and open and uh, the Riviera Business Club have been working very closely with them. So I think that would be for someone that's listening that was thinking about launching a new business in 2019. Uh, that would be a great place to start with the CCI, that course. Have you got any tips that you could share with us on places to visit on the Côte d'Azur? Where would you go on your day off? Well, you know, uh, on my days off, I like to go into Italy because it's so much fun. Uh, yeah, but where in Italy would you go? The, chal the, 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 the challenge is, is not like where you can go. The challenge is how do you get access to things you, you can't get into? And this is, this is where, you know, someone like me has the advantage. For example, you know, if you want to do the Dan Brown kind of tour, you know, where you, you, you can go into the Cathedral of Nice, for example. <clears throat> the Cathedral of Nice, St. Raparat, 
you can walk through, you can see it just like everybody else. But, you know, the doors are closed. You know, there are, there are you know, tapes that block you from going to places. And, and of course, that's where I want to go. I want to go to the places I'm not allowed to go. I want to go to the places that are closed. And so, you know, that's what we, we do at Vianitsa. When we take you into St. Robert, we take you behind. We take you to the places that no one can go to. We take you to the secret, you know, alleys. We take you up into the, you know, the private residences. <clears throat> we take you to the places that you really want to go to that you can't. So everything, and the other problem you have in this region is that because there's very little money, everything's closed. So if you want to visit the sanctuary and you haven't arranged for it, it's locked. So, you know, having the, the keys to, to open the doors is, is really, you know, something that, that and, and although it was, you know, the birthplace of tourism, <clears throat> today what they really uh, want tourists to do is spend money at the shops, the same shops you have all over the world, you know, and, and be at the places that they have designated for tourists. And if you are like me, all you want to do is, is go to the places that there are, I used to say, if there are people that look like me, I don't want to be there, you know? And so it was in, uh, the concept that I want to go to the places you can't go, but they're not, they're not really available. They're not open. And, and that's one of the, that's one of the reasons why we have Via Nitsa. And so to, to, to open them, you need two things. You need, you need to know the people that are <clears throat> working in the world of um, cultural mediation. And those people definitely do not speak English. So you either enter in Italy, you enter into Italian, in the French side, you enter into French. But once you can, if you can speak the two languages, well, you have an advantage, but then you have to find the people to be able to access. So none of it's easy. Tourism seems easy here, but as you know, when you have visitors, you know, where do you take them? Probably you end up going to the same places and seeing the same things. And, um, and yeah, I would be curious to know, you know, if after taking, you know, them the 50th time to Valbonne, not the same people, but yourself, or to, you know, St. Paul de Vence, um, maybe, you know, those people you ask, they won't really remember what they did in those places. They just remember the times that they spent with you. Oh, yes, totally. And um, how can people go about booking visits with you? It's a good question. You know, we have a website, vianitsa.com. You know, we are we are mo ma mainly focused on um, you know, people have to tell us what they're interested in. We develop it, and it depends on who's available to speak. It's a, it uh, we we can put together things depending on the date. There may be certain events that are quite interesting. You know, if we if we do a festival, festivals are great. You can walk through a festival. You can buy some cheese and you know and some saucisson. But if you really want to understand what's going on, if you want to be there, you know, having lunch with the mayor. You know, that's not so easy to do, but those are the kinds of things that become more memorable. So I think the best way is just to contact us through, through Vianitsa, and, um, and especially for those people who might be interested in knowing the history of their home, what the background was from before their house was built, uh, who lived there, what it was, uh, who, who was in it, you know, all the things that occurred around the house. Um, give us a, you know, give us a call and we'll try to figure it out. And if, if, if we can do it uh, for, for free, we will, because it's, uh, you know, it's not, um, it's not for commercial reasons, but if I have to put together a, a group, obviously if I have a group of, of two people, it's very difficult to get the mayor to sit down with us. So if I have a group of eight people, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's that much more easier. And, you know, if we do a visit of, for example, the Italian and the French, um, uh, border we may start in you know in the areas where you have lots of immigrants that have been crossing african immigrants and we may have a historian of the border come and speak during a lunch at you know at a at a, at a restaurant probably you've never been to and never heard of that's very very local and then as we move up the the valley of the roya you know we see just more and more interesting things and all along the key of what we do is the people that we interact with so it's why I can't say, well, it's just great. Go to the, you know, the sanctuary in, in the wig, you know, but if you got there, if it was open, <clears throat> if, how would you understand it? You wouldn't, you see, you would be left alone and you'd be looking and not understanding what you were looking at. And I think that that's, that's not integration. You know, integration is when you're able to gain access to the people that are interesting, that can share with you what it is that they're doing. And um, in this way, you know, you take something back and you give something and you leave something as well. Brilliant. I love it. What should be on my reading book, Robert, for next, my reading list for next year? Give me, give me a book that I should have for 2018. <clears throat> you must have a plethora of books. 
well, you know, doing a doctorate, I have to read, you know, thousands of books. But I'll tell you the, the, the book I'm reading now, which is uh, the one by um, uh, Zemmour, you know, um, it's not the Destin Francais. Uh, now I forget the, the title. It just came out by Eric Zemmour. It's really quite interesting uh, looking at this whole issue of, of, the, of, of France versus immigration. You know, basically the topics that we, we hear about in the news today are the things that interest me. And, and, and today I just received a copy from Emile um, Zola, who was, you know, a very, very famous French um, writer. And uh, he interests me because he speaks about these, you know, these carpetbaggers, these ones that, that made lots and lots and lots of money taking advantage of people in, in Paris. And of course, those are the ones who ended up moving to the Côte d'Azur. Perfect. Well, I will look that up and I'll put it in the show notes so that anyone who wants a nice challenge in 2019 uh, can, can go for one of those books. Well, Robert Levita, thank you very much for joining us on the Riviera Firefly podcast. And I uh, hope to catch up with you soon in uh, Barcelou, maybe for a coffee. <laughs> I will look and forward to one of your visits. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bon journée.
The Riviera Firefly podcast appreciates every contributor and listener. Your comments, likes and shares make us really happy and inspire us to keep doing the shows. Come join us in our free community groups on Facebook, Côte d'Azur Living, for all things south of France. And for those running a business, you need to join the Riviera Firefly business cocoon. It's totally free. The costs of producing and hosting this podcast are funded by Kiddyland. Nicknamed by their clients, The Little English School, they organise fun activities, all in English, for 0 to 16 year olds from baby clubs and playgroups to English lessons and holiday camps. They even hold workshops for adults too, right here on the Côte d'Azur. You can find out more about Kiduland directly on their website, www.kiduland.com. So thanks for listening. Please do pay it forward and share an episode so we can spread the Côte d'Azur love. Until next time, Fireflies, au revoir.